You know, without speaking like a clairvoyant or psychic, I dare to say that a hike in the electricity tariff was coming. Bigger electricity consumers, at least I should tell you, those listed as Band A customers are to pay more for electricity consumption. Band A are customers enjoying a 20-hour supply of power every day. The Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission, NERC, announced the increase on Wednesday. As it stands, the new tariff is fixed at 225 Naira, uh, up from 66 Naira per kilowatt of electricity, oh. mm. an increase of about 300%. Uh, we have a guest in the course of the chat, as I said. But GD, did you see this coming? No. Okay. No. I know that the Minister of Power had been talking about the fact that this subsidy is not sustainable, but not long ago, the President expressed a desire to keep the electricity subsidy. Yeah. And um, I thought that, given his body language, that um, they will not touch that subsidy at all. But what we have seen now is actually a partial removal of a uh, subsidy. Uh, and we are told that it will not affect everybody, it will affect the big electricity users, those who use about 20 hours of electricity per day. And the question people are asking is, how many Nigerians actually enjoy 20 hours of electricity? How do you determine it? Yeah. No, it's, it's possible. Majid, for example, where he lives, he lives um, uh, far away from the Lazarus Stratum of society. Okay. So he enjoy <laughs> highbrow, high if you like. Yeah, no, I just didn't want to use that word. They enjoy. He's also crying. They, they, they enjoy. <laughs> they enjoy much more electricity than the rest of us. Okay. So his area can be classified as Band one, a. one of yes, the targeted yeah. areas. Okay. But I don't know whether he actually enjoys up to twenty. Uh, uninterrupted hours of electricity, but whichever way we look at it, it is um, big, and um, even the rich will complain. My own concern is how much impact it could have on inflationary trend. Yeah. Uh, will it push um, big companies to? Um, ensure that um, people pay more for the services that they render. Mm. As it stands now, 24 hours of electricity per day will cost a staggering 5,400 naira, amounting to 162,000 mm. a month and 1,971,000 naira a year. A year. But what I actually spend on uh, on electricity, on um, on fuel, on petrol in a day is higher than this. It's higher than the 5,400. Way higher. Because if your, your petrol generator consumes like 25 liters mm -hmm. in a day, Compare 25 liters to 5,400. Hmm. The difference is like night and day. Yeah. There are many yeah. people whom, if they are guaranteed that 20 hours a day, people who are into making um, um, milk, producing milk, yogurt, and the rest of them, mm. they need electricity. <coughs> like it is the oxygen. And cold, yeah. cold rooms. Yes. And People cold stores, have cold yeah. stores and all that. If you can give them 24 hours of uninterrupted power supply, they will be ready to pay this, or pay this amount, 5,400 a day mm. or even more. That is, the, that is the truth. We've got to look at the bigger picture. But anything that will make Nigerians spend more money will reduce their disposable income and I can understand why 
many people are not happy. Okay, okay. Um, but mine is the information should have been on long, long before now. Usually when government wants to remove subsidy, they don't announce. Going back to the Obama and Joe years, we just hear that the decision has been hurriedly taken. Hmm. Uh, so, um, Majid, my people say when you carry stick and beat the drum without knowing the, the theme or, or, or the, you know, a lot of things will give. Yeah, um, as Jide rightly said, that's why I told him that, yes, the rich also cry. I live at an area where they classify us as um, prestige customers, which means we are in band A. Before this new tariff um, was on 66 naira per kilowatt hour. Oh, yeah. Now from 66 naira per kilowatt, uh, kilowatt hour, we are now on 225. Hmm. Because this is a practical experience. Before now, if I vent 5,000, I mean 50,000 naira, I get 640 units of electricity. Now, <clears throat> this morning, I, I vent um, 50,000 and I got 204. And like Gide rightly captured it, averagely, just mm -hmm. myself and my wife at home, averagely we use between 50 and 60 units per day, which means this 50,000 cannot take me more than four days or five days now. That's if I don't have visitors and now I go to each room to put off. It's only where we need electricity mm. that we put on it. So I don't know what more to cut. <laughs> but one thing this will teach us is for us to know that electricity is very important. Mm. Yeah. We, just, we don't have to be wasting it. At times, you just see, leave the lights on. You just leave the lights on. You leave security uh, lights on in broad daylight. But beyond increasing this, they say it's as a result of the need for the discos to be able to pay for gas and they also maintain their equipment. We have a, a, a friend in the studio here who is from South Africa. South Africa has 70,000 megawatts. Mm. We have never been able to hit 10,000 megawatts in Nigeria. And our need is about 50,000 But you know why? Megawatts. Transmission yeah. is a big deal. Yes, it's, it's, it's a big deal. But we don't even have the capacity to store. That's why the grid keeps collapsing. Yeah. Anytime it goes to a particular threshold, something it, breaks. It will, it will collapse. Some system yeah. collapse. So, I mean, I, I saw the uh, analysis uh, from uh, GDA, was it yesterday or day before yesterday, telling us the, uh, how many times the grid has collapsed in the last two years. So, we need to work on this and uh, ensure that those, there's no reason we, should, we shouldn't have 24 hours electricity. It shouldn't be that. A, a, a serious problem for us to crack. And I believe that uh, there is no excuse now for the minister and the TCN and the NARC and the discos because now, although they say this is just for band A, it won't yeah. affect those who are below those because uh, they, they claim that the, those in band, this band A represent, uses about 40% of the electricity yeah. that, we, uh, yeah. uh, that, mm. that we, we, we produce. So, um, it's like um, the government has taken uh, subsidy off those who are in the upper echelon, mm -hmm. uh, those who have 20 uh, hours and above of electricity per, uh, per, per, per day. All right. Thank you. Uh, we'll break down the bands. We have up to five bands, we'll let you know. Uh, but now I can tell you, Professor of Energy and Electricity Law at the University of Lagos, that's a Professor Yemi Oke. He's ready for us. Uh, Prof, I greet you. Well, uh, how are you? Welcome. I greet you too. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Yeah, can, can we talk about uh, uh, the, new, the new tariff and related matters? Why, why, why did the government um, think it is necessary at this time to come up with this new uh, tariff regime? Thank you. Um, let's, let's talk, let, I'm going to talk as a Nigerian because we are all in this challenge together. The starting point is to realize that Nigerians 
would not forgive the current administration of President Bola Metinobo if he dares repeat the mistakes of the past. Hmm. We've made a number of mistakes in the power sector. And nobody can deny that. We made the mistake under the former president, Lucia Gombasanjo. We made a few mistakes under the late Gerard. Made a number of unpardonable errors under Jonathan. We sustained those errors under President Mamadou Bari. With the current administration, who as some of us researchers have discovered, will appear to have seen it coming with what he experimented with, which, due to certain political considerations, he couldn't achieve with the Lagos Aaron thing. So, and we always argue, if we as Nigerians, irrespective of the political divide we belong, had supported that initiative, I'd allow Lagos Aaron project to work in 1999, 2001. Perhaps we would not, you and I would not be sitting here talking about states should not start to generate, we should start to do rural electrification. We would not be where we are, that's the truth. So if somebody who had experimented that years back is now in charge and is now not going the direction in line with what he saw years back, the Nigerians will not forgive him. And that is why when we saw the body language of the current administration, which shows clearly that this regime wasn't ready to sustain the mistakes of the past, some of us in the sector felt a bit of relief because we were waiting to see the real action and the actions have started coming. Nigeria's power sector was added in a journey of no return. And this has been my argument for more than 15 years. We are just at the brink of collapse in the power sector. As I always say, I would argue that, okay, the power sector is about to collapse on all of us, myself inclusive. We have to do something. And that's where we are now. Honestly, patriotically, we've just taken the right steps with this. And I can go on to analyze why this is the right thing to do at this point in time. No sentiments. Why do you think this is the best decision to take at this time? Is it a yes. problem of urgency in the sector or simply that things um, or simply that um, we've never really had appropriate pricing? Or relay is the problem. Okay. Thank you very much. When Nigeria had been living on false hopes as far as the power sector is concerned, I would have to start to ask the right questions. One, when we privatized years ago, how many megawatts were we generating and distributing as a country? Two, more than a decade after, how many megawatts are we generating and distributing? Three, when those entities were sold, how much foreign direct investment entered Nigeria? How much did Nigeria as a polity, polity, as a system, as a government, as a bunch, realize from the sale of power sector assets? Who and who bought those assets and how much have they invested in taking the power sector forward? And I'll be honest with you. I had issues with the previous administration because it took just about the tail end of the last administration, the former president, had to come on here to acknowledge the fact that it appeared the sale of power sector was a, for a kind of political patronage, which we had argued. When those entities bought these power assets, as time to be corrected, foreign direct investment did not enter Nigeria. What happened? The players approached Nigerian banks 
for what we in the sector will call acquisition financing, money to acquire those assets. They acquire, they got the money from Nigerian banks. Nigerian banks also entered into all kinds of integrated facilities to get money from their lenders abroad. They entered the Nigerian market when Naira was 161 to 166 per dollar. They borrowed dollars to trade in tariffs in Naira. The first challenge they had was that we predicted that about five banks was, were going to go down because of their huge exposure to the power sector. Some of them actually exceeded their single digit limit. Not up to five banks died, but about three or four died, as speculated. Now, those entities now realize that dollars started going up north. So for them to be in business means to service their loans and invest, they will need now to be charging at parity with the dollar exchange rate. Meaning the loan they had at 161 Naira is now about 1,009, then gladly it's now about 1,002. That was the first sign of problems. That is why 90% 98% of those discos are not solvent. They are technically insolvent. And you hear today, one disco is under one bank, one liquidator, one receiver manager, and it's been like that for almost all of them. No new investor is able to come in because when you want to get into a new sector, you go to ask from the players how they, they are faring. And the existing players had no good news, good stories to tell. So, and again, we look at the legal framework. The Electric Power Sector Reform Act that 2005 now repealed was one of the challenges we had because it was just to bring about sector reforms. And the law was used to continue to operationalize the sector. It wasn't a law meant to operationalize the sector. It was a main law meant to bring reforms. And the law was actually at variance even with what the Constitution says. And we've been having these challenges. And again, federal government brought on board Embed. Embed was supposed to be a kind of interim arrangement to encourage gas producers to produce gas so that there will be offered the fee stock for electricity in Nigeria is essentially gas. So they will need to stimulate gas production for the purpose of the power sector. Gas players are not making money. Because the product they sell is an international commodity, it's bought and sold in advance. You will not hear of anybody producing gas and there's no market for it. And then we, we skewed something in the law to ensure that they are able to deploy what is called patriotic obligation. We call that uh, domestic gas obligation, meaning you have to produce, set aside a quantum of your gas for domestic market, essentially the power sector. They agreed to do that, but they were doing that at huge losses. Government now stepped forward to mitigate their losses through Embert. Embert was not paying for the shortfalls from the federal government through guarantees and so many other structures. And the Nigerian government was now spending hugely, much more, in a supposedly privatized power sector, more than it was spending, spending even before privatization. As if that was not sufficient. The Jenkos couldn't recover fully the money for the megawatts sent to the distributors. Discos. The discos couldn't recover their invoices from Nigerians because transmission losses, a lot of Nigerians are bypassing the meters. So the money this, that the federal government gives for the purpose of indirect subsidies in the power sector has been a wasteful adventure. Meaning, technically, government has been subsidizing waste. Government has been subsidizing darkness. The presumption is that once you have subsidy for the purpose of a service or a product, you're going to get a product. In the case of the petroleum sector, the subsidy was dead then, you will get to the filling station, you get petrol. But in the case of the power sector, government put subsidies that we kicked against. 
but we couldn't see the effect of the subsidy. It supposes that once something is of that, at least you're going to see the effect on Nigerians. So, government has been subsidizing darkness. Government has been subsidizing wastefulness. Because there is no incentive for the players to get efficient with their production cost. Government yes. has been subsidizing production. If government subsidizes, it be 10% or 20% of the total cost, government puts down 10% or 20% of production cost for 4,000 megawatts. By the time you have generation losses, transmission losses, and it gets to the discourse, a lot of Nigerians, across, on, unscrupulous Nigerians, those, they will bypass. At the end of the day, the subsidy will be a waste. About 40 to 30% of it is a waste. Government has been subsidizing waste and inefficiency in the power sector. And we said, that's not the right way to go. Subsidy is the right thing to do. We have subsidy in other countries. When you see their invoice, once you see their electricity, ut your utility bills, you're going to see the quantum of subsidy that government pays directly to the consumers, not at the level of production because we are subsidizing big players and they're not going to get efficient with their production. In other countries, Belgium, UK, you have subsidy that goes directly to the consumers. That was, that was the framework we had under the repeal uh, electric power sector reform act of 2005. We had yeah. PICAF. PICAF is a pool of fund, Power Consumer Assistance Fund. It was targeted at putting money directly into the pocket of eligible Nigerians who might not be able to afford increases in electricity tariffs. So the intention of the law, now repealed, was that the subsidy should go directly to consumers. Gladly, under the new electricity act of 2023, the same pickup is retained. Until the repealed law, pickup was never operationalized. Under the current law, pickup has not been operationalized. Pickup is the right thing to do to give eligible Nigerians direct subsidy. Government shouldn't subsidize those who can afford their pattern of electricity consumption. Government shouldn't continue to subsidize those who can afford to have 30 air conditioning system in their rooms. As against someone who needs just a punch of electricity and small farm. So we felt we needed to rework the mathematics of the entire power sector, including the subsidy regime. And when government realized that oh, we can't continue with this because it's no longer sustainable. Honestly, I was dancing. Yeah. Yeah. I was there dancing. I knew my country was headed in a journey of no return because the subsidy regime was going to go on and on, and now it's about three trillion, and by next year is going to be four trillion naira. All right, Prof. and I know let, let... eighty percent of the subsidy, seventy to eighty percent, is going into production. And the atmosphere yeah. is not too transparent. It's not okay. So we need that to change it. And we're just headed in the right direction now. Okay. Okay, Prof. It couldn't have been otherwise. Let's pause there now. Um, we want to have a commercial break. We'll return to you. Just, just stay there. So let's go on this commercial break, uh, break folks. Uh, please don't go away just yet. All right, we'll return now to Professor Yemi Oke. Okay. He's a professor of energy and electricity law. Prof, are you there? Yeah, Prof, let, let's uh, continue from where you... you, you... Hello, Prof, uh, uh, can you hear us? Yeah, my, my question is... I can, I'm fully with you. Okay, yeah, my, my question... Uh, thank you for laying the foundation for, uh, for us and for Nigerians. Um, now, basically... To, to, for a layman, there is, I mean, appropriate pricing now, quote and unquote. There are three legs, generation, transmission, and distribution. Mm. Are we now going yes. to have efficiency in these three critical areas? I mean, generation, transmission, and distribution. Thank you. And you give that guarantee. <laughs> 
Only Nigerian banks give bank, bank, BG, bank guarantee. But I'm going to give all that guarantee that if you continue this route, the way we're doing it now, we'll most likely get it right. Has it ever bothered you as a Nigerian? Has it ever bothered Nigerians that this current type of situation was not the one that privatized? It was privatized far back as reform started with the Obasanjo, then uh, uh, Yadra, Jonathan, and the rest. Has it ever bothered you that Nigeria was around 3,000, 3,000, 3,000, 4,000 megawatts before privatization? And a decade after, we are still around 4,000, 4,000, they are about 10 years plus after privatization. Nigeria is now spending much more in a supposedly privatized power sector. Nigerians are still in darkness, perhaps paying more for darkness 10 years after privatization. Should we continue that route? The answer is no. Are we now doing the right thing? Honestly, the answer is yes. Let me start from the first one, the transmission. I have my issues with the transmission. The federal government is still the owner of the transmission infrastructure 100%. The first ugly experience I had was with the Manitoba Hydro. In 2014-2015, a Canadian firm called Manitoba Hydro International was approached by the federal government to do what? To come and take charge of the transmission for purposes of managing it. They entered into transmission management contract. I wasn't comfortable. I saw a few things wrong, a lot of things wrong. And I said, this will not carry us to where we are going. When they couldn't listen to me, I put pen to paper. I expressed my feelings. And two months later, all what we predicted happened. And people said that was a wish. Ooh, I said, we don't need to be a social because we saw we are headed in the wrong direction. Now, my Manitoba is gone. They couldn't manage the transmission infrastructure of Nigeria, and TCN is federal government's baby. Now we have Siemens. Siemens, I think, is about to bring some miracles. I'm still waiting for the miracles because the miracles ought to have happened like three, four years ago. It's not happening yet, and I'm not as optimistic. I've said that severally, and I'm still saying it. As a concerned Nigerian, I will be pleasantly surprised if the, if the Siemens people are able to get miraculous with what they promised. Gladly, the president got to Germany. He took it upon himself as a leader to go and ask relevant questions with the Siemens people, with the German chancellor. We are hoping we're going to get it right at the level of transmission. But for the transmission, the world is going off-grid. Mm -hmm. Just as we argue elsewhere that, oh, the world is taking cars off the road, Nigerians are putting cars on the road. The world is going off-grid. The world is going decentralized grid. The world is going concession grid. The world is going mini-grid. Mobile power plant. So many renewable options. Extensive solarization. We are still battling with that grid. The grid was conceived as a structure to service a few people. We have expanded in leaps and bounds as a country of over 200 million. Now, the grid can no longer accommodate. That is why, for instance, in the petroleum sector, if you have a tank that is designed for 5,000 liters, any attempt to put 6,000 is going to bust. The same thing. The grid infrastructure is weak. It's designed for minimal capacity. Any attempt to exceed that limit you're going to have grid collapse. And there are other factors that will lead to grid collapses. That's why we've been having grid collapses for obvious reasons, low rejection and others. At some point, we predicted we are going to have like average of 10 to 12 per year, and that has been happening. Is that the way to go? No. Do we have a problem with the grid? Yes. Are we about to solve it? Yes. Is it solved already? No. 
Are there signs that it might be solved? Yes. Going to the generation. Generation is a major challenge. We have hydro generation here and there. We have stranded megawatts here and there. That couldn't be evacuated on the national grid. Why? Because the grid infrastructure is very weak. If you exceed the capacity, it's going to bust. Have we expanded the grid with auto? Have we revamped the grid with auto? Was that proper grid management? I'm not sure. Because those grids started in 1861 and weren't paying sufficient attention to it. But now we shouldn't even be talking of a federated grid in the 21st century. That's why I'm glad that we're able to have our way in terms of decentralized energy option that brought about concept, considering concession of powers to state government to now generate, transmit, and distribute in respect of areas both covered by national grid and those not covered by national grid. Power has never been a federated thing. Under the unamended constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, second schedule, attempt 13, federal government was in charge of on grid in terms of generation, transmission, and distribution. Why states specifically had powers in respect of areas not covered by a national grid under the unamended version of the Constitution? But under the anomaly we had was under the Electric Power Sector Reform Act, now repealed, it was centralized. It was centralized to a ridiculous extent that we now had items that ought not to be the burden of the federal government being given to the federal government. For instance, relativification agency, relativification fund. Under the unamended constitution, rural, rural electrification connotes rural. It is off-grid. But it, the, the act was going against the constitution. We pointed it out. I pointed it out. But nobody was listening. And now, federal government was now concerning itself with issues as mundane as solar, wind in the rural areas, in the communities. That was not going to be sustainable, and the cost was humongous, not done transparently. From inception, it, it, from inception that was why the first thing that happened with the Rural Electrification Agency and Fund was the issue of corruption and embezzlement. That happened years back, 2013. I'm not going to mention names. Like I said in another studio, if you Google it, you're going to see the name of a junior brother of a powerful banker who was the chairman of House Committee on Power. It was about this relativification agency, relativification fund. Recently, President Bola Chunubu had to sack the MD or relativification agency. Rural Education Agency and Fund, to me, was just a job for the boys. Somebody will come from Abuja to come and put solar panel in your father's village in Najegu, in Ijegu, in Alabata, my father's uh, ancestral home. What is the business of the federal government rural electrification? Those should be considered to state, and state can team up with the local government. We even said it could be as reasonably structured for like getting, we have 774 local government, if a local government generates one megawatt in two years, in the four year tenure of the regime, each local government in Nigeria will generate two megawatts multiplied by 774. That will be about double the size of the current megawatt that we have. It's not the state government that's going to bring the money down. The state government will bring investors and other players to scale down and they invest in mini grids, small grids, off grid, extensive solarization. And that fills up the space in terms of the mega that we have at the federal government. So, in terms of generation, it's essentially gas fired. God, gas is a fuel stock. They couldn't pay for gas. The gas producers got tired of humongous debt the players are holding them, Embed and others. They stopped giving gas to the power sector. The fortune of the power sector started getting, became dwindled. They had no gas, actually, to power 
the sector to fire their plants. The federal government couldn't continue to subsidize. And there are Nigerians who are willing to pay more. Quite frankly, even the household consumers will be willing to pay slightly more for electricity if they have supply. It will always be cheaper to have grid generation as against alternative to diesel and petrol and embedded another option. So if you are guaranteeing me more hours of supply and I'm paying for what I'm consuming, definitely it will ultimately be cheaper as against going bad another option. When the Jenkos can afford to pay for gas, when the discos are able to recover their money, their cost, with appropriate tariff, when an average Nigerian, an average Nigerian has meters and can regulate his uh, consumption pattern, in the case of petroleum subsidy that was just heavily removed, those who are having 50 liters, 40 liters, scale down, they are now buying 20 liters, they will not embark on frivolous journeys. The same thing with the power sector. If you can't afford 10 hours of consumption, because you have prepaid meters, you can manage your consumption pattern. You can afford to put yourself in darkness and buy units that will last you two hours, take two hours per day. It will bring about efficiency in the system. It will give more money to government to give subsidy to direct consumers who need it as against subsidizing those who can afford consumption. It will free up the market for healthy competition. It will encourage the investor to bring money and invest in the power sector because it's going to be a you know, kind of demand and supply thing. And they know they can generate, they can make their money, they sell, make their profit. The rest that we were before, patriotically speaking, was never going to be sustainable. And I predicted a total collapse of the power sector in two, three years. When you had these schools that 98% of them are insolvent, does that not tell you something? When after 20 years, if we had waited to 20 years, you can't even generate up to the megawatts we are generating before privatization. Those are dangerous signals that would tell even the most uneducated person that all is not well with the power sector in Nigeria. Yeah. I'm just in there to take difficult decisions. I, this administration, honestly speaking, is never afraid of taking difficult decisions for and in the interest of Nigeria. And everybody is saying that. Sentiments apart. These are Thank you. progressive steps that have been taken because the options, the alternatives are just disastrous if we are to embark on those alternatives. There, actually, there are no alternatives to what we are doing now. Because it's going to be, uh, it's the way to go and it's going to be impactful. Yeah, yeah. Progress-wise. Yeah. In terms of national growth and development. Even for industrial growth, job thank, creation. Thank you, thank you Prof. So if you don't have power, we're not heading anywhere. If nobody is willing to invest in the power sector, because the sector is not liquid, we won't have power. If we don't have power to power our development and growth, we will not grow in it. We will not mm. develop no sentiments. Is that we are ready to take the boost by the horn, take some difficult decisions, endure it, and smile at the end of the day? That's where right. we are. I think we are headed. In. Thank you, Prof. Thank uh, you. We, we cannot thank you enough for your insightful uh, submission. You know, uh, all three of us say, a big thank you to you. Uh, thank gentlemen. you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Yeah. I think he's been able to break it down. I mean, oh, yeah. to all, all the critical uh, uh, yes. areas. His, uh, his knowledge of the sector is uh, infectious. And I, I think uh, the government needs to talk to somebody like Prof to assist the, the Minister of uh, uh, Power. Uh, yes. uh, in, they need somebody they need, like they need, um, because it's somebody like a, very knowledgeable. Yes, it's like Nusa Dramos. He saw all these things and he's been saying it because I listened to his uh, uh, commentaries way back, 10, 15 years ago. Mm. He's been saying the same thing. And it, it, I mean, it's been right on the point. Mm. 
So uh, and, the minister needs to talk to him. And uh, Jami Ujide, if we get our power problems solved in good time, we would be in good stead. Yes, yeah. it will propel us to real growth. Obviously, obviously. Mm. We're, we're, we're not talking about magic. Mm.